Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to PG Crypto Avast. Uh, this is, I think, the last like hour or 45 minutes of sessions before we get to sort of celebrate our closing ceremonies. Um, so anyway, thank you for sticking with me here. This is also a somewhat odd topic for sort of just a Postgres conference, but uh, um, I will definitely talk about Postgres today. Let me introduce myself first. My name is Drew Engelson. I uh, live in Washington, D.C. I work for a company called Celerity. We're a technology consulting company. Uh, we do lots of work with uh, you know, big banks, uh, healthcare, and, and my personal sort of bread and butter is in the media industry. A lot of like heavy media publishers, uh, you probably know many of them, National Geographic, PBS, Gannett, US News and World Report, or um, I am the chief technologist there. I do a lot of technology strategy. I lead the de development teams that we have. And um, I love getting my hands dirty in code still to this day. So um, some things I hope to talk about today are Postgres. We wouldn't be here today if I didn't talk about that. Um, and I will be the first to admit that uh, when I started my uh, work in the Django world, it was mostly MySQL. Um, which I loved at the time, but now these days all of my uh, development on Django is Postgres or some other uh, weird database. We'll talk about Django as well, uh, which is embedded in Python. We'll talk about National Geographic, which is a particular project uh, I did for them. And we will do a little bit of black hattery, which will be fun to talk about. Uh, so first I want to get a raise of hands. So who has uh, some experience in Python? Excellent. Everybody. How about Django? except for the uh, Django hater over here. Um, who knows anything about Postgres? Um, that's just kidding. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of National Geographic. Um, have you either read it, seen it, or went online to watch it? And Black Hattery, we're going to talk about um, some of the things I had to resort to for one of my projects. Let's start with some background. Um, this is a website on National Geographic called Your Shot. This is uh, yourshot.nationalgeographic.com. It is a uh, photo community uh, map. There is both a web and a mobile version of this thing. Um, basically, it's like, um, imagine Flickr, where you can upload your photos, but not all your photos, just your best photos. And imagine if um, you know, the editors of this application, really the National Geographic for professional photographers and the photo editors that pick photos for the magazine and TV site, if they could comment on your photos, and it's exactly what this site was built to do, to really create deep engagement with the National Geographic brand, um, is a very active community uh, in this uh, application. People upload photos. You can see uh, you know, these editors' notes. There's editors, the National Geographic photo editors are commenting on your photography, saying, hey, great shot, or maybe if you use this filter, it might have come out a little, little sleeker. Uh, it's a beautiful site. In fact, this photography is what really sells the site. Um, but for all that, the thing I'm really talking about today is this, the login button. That's basically it. You need to sign into this application to do anything, or at least to participate. Um, now, in this particular case, like in, I build many applications where people sign in. Uh, this was delegated off to a, another application, speaking of, of uh, OAuth, a single sign-on provider. Uh, which was basically a, uh, also being built at the exact same time I was building your shot. So we were building to something that didn't exist, which is always fun and uh, fine and dandy. Um, but the key thing here is I didn't have actually control over the users that were in this system. I had to integrate with that thing. Um, again, it didn't exist at the moment. So let's talk a little bit about some of the architecture for your shot. Uh, this is basically, it was built a few years ago. We're on Python 2.7 using Django. The database, the primary database was Postgres. Uh, it's a heavy search application that uses Elasticsearch. Um, you know, RabbitMQ for its uh, message queue, Memcached for sort of uh, app caching. Akamai was a CDN for accelerating the delivery of the application. Um, on the Python side of things, PsychoPG2 for connecting to Postgres. Pillow, which is a, uh, if you feel Pillow, everybody, let me talk about it. Python image library, PIL, is a very common way to manipulate images but it's horrible to install and configure and is not really portable across platforms. So a uh, colleague of mine, Alex Clark, uh, wrote Pillow, which is basically a fluffy wrapper around pill to make it easy to install, easy to, less of a headache, really. Um, Celery for managing the connectivity to the uh, RabbitMQ. Uh, Haystack for integrating with Search and Elasticsearch. 
there's a lot of social activity on this thing. There's you know there's commenting. There's uh, you know favoriting, loving things, sharing. Uh, Gigia was really used for most of uh, that integration, and, and it's a big mapping feature. And Mapbox was our, is still my favorite mapping tool. And to put that in, into some boxes. We see uh, really on the right side of the screen, those green boxes, that's the SSO platform that was being built separately at the same time while my team was building all the other boxes, the white and orange and pink and yellow. Um, but for the most part, um, we're focused here primarily on that integration point between the two. I have an application which has its own database, which is what Django really wants to have, um, and another system altogether that is how we log in. Now, your shot was a new site that I built, but it really was an evolution of a site that was called My Shot that had been, had been built uh, many years prior, uh, had its own database full of users, and we would really wanted to make sure that when we launched the new Your Shot site, the user would have a very little, uh, other than seeing a new site, uh, no awareness that their account was migrated. Um, so really, our challenge here is to migrate, you know, at the time it was 350,000 users, now there's several, several million, um, but they do it completely invisibly to the users. Um, and really, let's just sort of, you know, talk about how to do that in, in, the, in the least impactful way for the user. All right, so where do we start from? The MyShot, the legacy application, uh, had a table called users. This is all sort of abstracted information, not the actual information. Um, but we had a table called users, and it had username and password. That's how people were authenticating against that table. Well, one thing I learned is, wow, that's, it's a Postgres database. Yay! Um, we see the password field is encrypted and follows a format, dollar sign one, dollar sign blah, dollar sign blah, 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 blah. Um, now, at the time, I wasn't exactly sure where that came from or what that meant. You could, everyone know what that means? Good? What does it mean? Uh, what hash algorithm is used, what's the salt, and then what's the Right, exactly. So, I also found this thing, a uh, Perl script uh, on the server somewhere, and, and I able to sort of, it made many files that were laying around. Uh, saw this insert statement, insert into users, where values are the username and then crypt. That was interesting. This is the bit where the password gets created, right? Um, so at the time, I didn't know what that was. I did some investigation, and sure enough, it is the, um, the Postgres PG crypto uh, extension. Uh, that's how he creates, uh, you know, hashed passwords. It was using a MD5, using the gen salt to create a salt, and then taking the password crypt will encrypt the hash and store it in the database in the password field in this case. So how do we um, how do I take that table and migrate into my system without knowing their passwords? Uh, well, we can certainly try and crack the passwords. Um, that sounds like a lot of fun. So how, how do you go? How do you go about doing that? You know, is that even possible? Um, well, let's just talk. So this, this, when we talk about cracking the passwords, we're talking about a couple of different things. Uh, if you were trying to break into someone's website and you might be filling in the web interface and logging, you know, filling the, the login form many times over and over again until you get a hit. It's not what we're talking about here. I have I already have a list of users' names and hashed passwords. Um, so I'm, I, don't, I don't need that other approach. I'm doing the, uh, the white hat approach to actually trying to figure out how do I make these things useful to me in this application. Well, the way you go about doing that is you first uh, identify what algorithm is being used. We talked about that already. There's a hint there. Um, and then we take like every possible password that it could be. So that means knowing what the, the key space is, what letters and numbers and characters might be possibly be in the password. Um, and then just like generate the list of every possible one of those things and encrypt it with the same algorithm. Um, and then we simply compare, right? I'll have all the lists at that point, so I can say, oh, here's the a hash, so I have that hash in my list. If so, there's the password. So let's just, let's just take an example here. Let's take this, all right? Um, anyone know what this thing is? MD5 hash, MD5, exactly. So what do we know about this? It's a raw MD5 one-way hash, and, and to keep it simple for these examples, I'm gonna like, make this easy. We're going to just assume a four-character password with no funny characters, just letters and numbers, all right? Um, and, and even just that alone, just that character space alone, we have almost 15 million possible password combinations, right? Um, so, you know, we're very aware now as we start making this thing more complicated, that number gets tremendous. So how do we, um, how do we crack a password like that? You know, through, through using the method I just talked about. Well. Let's write a little Python. Since we're all familiar with Python here, here's a simple example. Well, 
we're going to take our character set and we're going to basically combine the uh, all ASCII letters and digits, okay? And we're going to use that as our character set. And then we're going to use the pretty cool uh, Inner Tools product, which is the Cartesian product of all the things uh, of length four, really, um, to get the, all the possible possible passwords that we could ever have uh, with that uh, character set. And then we are simply going to do a loop and attempt to uh, encode it with the, the hash, MD5 hash, and see if it matches. Done, right? That's pretty simple. If, it, if we do get a hit, we're going to just dump it out and print the password out. If not, we're going to say we couldn't crack it. Now, there's no reason why this should, should not be able to crack something, because it will just go until it finds a match. Um, now, let's just try it. So we run that. Boom. We crack that thing in like five seconds, right? Thor is our password. Uh, now, that was a single-threaded process on my MacBook Pro. Uh, it was a very short password and a limited character set. Um, now, this was a case where, in, in that example, I went through sequentially until I found a match. Now, if I, if I was doing this for this real project, I would just dump all the options out to a file or a database somewhere, and then I could do an easy lookup match for every one of them. In this case, I'm just spitting out the result in five seconds. I wrote my own little Python script for that, but there's plenty of tools that are out there today that do this open source. One of my favorites is John the Ripper. Um, John the Ripper is a pretty very flexible uh, cracker tool that takes, understands all different algorithms. Um, does a really nice job of, uh, you know, making word lists look like passwords. Um, so in this particular case, I wrote that same hash to a file. I said, I want to, this is the raw MD5 hash, which is going to let it short circuit some of the guesswork. And run it, and here we go. We got Thor as our answer in like three seconds, right? I think it's a little shorter. And it does take advantage of, uh, you know, parallel processing and a little more, uh, you know, CPU management here. Um, so let's just see, in this case, uh, speed considerations. So while my first attempt cracked the thing in five seconds, I, only, I didn't run through every possible uh, password combination. If I did run them all, it would have taken about almost 18 seconds, okay? That's about some tiny fraction of a second per attempt for a four character password. Now, let's just consider for a second eight to 12 character password space. Now, the same letters and numbers but we're getting a little bit bigger here. That number grows to, that's three sextillion something, 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 something. That's a lot of possibilities. Um, however, remember, some fraction of a second per attempt times three sextillion attempts equals something, you know, huge number of seconds equals 125 million years. Um, that's a lot. Um, now, I mentioned we're not going to have to go through every possible combination of letters for every password we're trying to crack, so it may be on average half of that, but that's still quite a bit. Now, 125 million years, for those who are familiar with the Kessel Run, is approximately 12 parsecs. No, I'm totally kidding. It's not all. Not all parsecs. Um, how could we speed things up, though? Well, we can delegate some of the CPU to the GPU, and in fact, John the Ripper does that. Um, we can run things in parallel. No reason they're just run through sequentially. We could use a supercomputer. That'll be a lot faster. Uh, we might also use the cloud. Now, I did a calculation here. Um, if I wanted to run 125 million years worth of uh, CPU um, on Amazon, I would need something like, uh, uh, Let's see, million, billion, so like over a trillion uh, C4 larges for one hour. If I ran over a trillion C4 larges for one hour in EC2, um, at 10 cents per hour, I'd crack them. I would crack every one of those passwords. It would cost me $101 billion to do so. Um, but I would, it's doable, totally doable. Now, there's a few other shortcuts we could take. Cheating is an easy one. You know, passwords are not always random. Um, you know, people are based on people's birth dates or names or kids' names or dogs' names. Um, John the Ripper does a nice job of taking common names and animal names and dates and stuff and making them passwordy. Um, that'll short circuit the thing quite a bit. Um, but really, uh, for me to crack that hash password, the fastest thing for me to do is look it up on Google. Um, there we go. I, so, you know, Google took 0.51 seconds to return that result. It took me longer than that to type the thing in, or at least copy and paste it in there. And you see our Thor reference, you know, like multiple times on this first results page. Well, what happened here? Why, why is that even possible? Well, the 
the first result uh, on that list was for a site mb5decoder.org. Well, it's already got written on an HTML page somewhere the fact that that hash is the MD5 hash of Thor. Um, so someone's already done that work for me. Why should I do it myself? Um, and so why does that exist? You know, and this is, by the way, this works for every, all sorts of hashes, that one-way hashes. Um, well, it works because of rainbow tables, right? People have done that work. People, you know, there's no reason for, if something might be reusable for someone else, let's put it, put it out there and make it easy. Um, rainbow tables are pre-computed tables for reversing cryptogra cryptographic hash algorithms. Um, Used for cracking passwords. So there's a site called Rainbow Crack, which is really cool, um, that will sell you like just already built rainbow tables of all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, and you see, here's, I, I wrote a Python script uh, that will just dump out this same password space, all the hashes, and you see, sure enough, there's our Thor in the middle there. Um, oh, and by the way, for every, all the code you see here, I've got a Git, Git repo I just threw up there that has all these examples and a working Django application that uses what I'm going to get to in a moment. Um, so, if things ex like this exist, if rainbow tables exist, how on earth are we going to like keep things secure? Um, so there's a few ways we can get a, you know defend against rainbow tables. Well, we can salt things, right? Salting, you know, we're actually adding something to the the password before we hash it, so we have to be, remember what that was, so we can undo this eventually, and that's why we you see the salt in the actual uh, PG crypto uh, string output. Another thing we can do is stretch it. And that basically means it'll run like the same hash algorithm many times, multiple iterations. Here's an example where I'm basically 10,000 iterations of the same uh, MD5 hash function to get the re re result. So even though it was, uh, you know, you know if, for example, if I ran in 125 million years we talked about earlier, uh, if I did just eight iterations of that same thing, uh, that, that, that becomes a million years, right? A billion years, sorry, a billion years. And strengthening is really just making, you know, stronger passwords with longer and all the character possible possibilities. Um, so what about our passwords that we have in our database now? Getting back to that. So we, we know it's in the password, the format of, of you know, we have listed here. Uh, as you mentioned, the dollar sign one means that's an MD5 crypt uh, algorithm. The second block is the actual salt that that password was encrypted with. And the third bit chunk is the actual, like, hash, right? So the string we have is a is a uh, algorithm identifier, the salt that was used, and the actual hash itself. Good. These are salt MD5 crypt hashes generated from the PG crypt extension. Excellent. All right, let's look it up in Google. Oops. Right? Um, as we said before, once things are salted, it becomes very hard to have a rainbow table to look things up, and therefore Google doesn't have a already pre-indexed page to display it for us. So that was a simple fix. Um, well, what else can we do? Well, I took the sa that same password and I ran it through John the Ripper. Actually, wait a minute. It cracked it in like a minute and 37 seconds. Well, that's because I, have, I actually have the, you know, I hinted at what this thing was, MD5 crypt. Um, it has the salt. It knows what the salt is, so it's basically doing the exact same thing where it's going through all the possible things, letters and combinations that it could be, salting each one of them and then encrypting it. So it actually can still match. Um, so it's still brute force, brute force, but much slower, right? Um, I couldn't do that on like, you know, 350,000 rec records very easily. All right, so this is about the time where I start to give up on cracking the passwords, right? Certainly, I, I, I put myself, pat myself on the back that if I had a billion or $100 billion, I could have done it. Um, and that was, by the way, with short passwords. Uh, these are not short passwords. These are complicated passwords. Uh, the really answer is they can never really crack them. Um, so how do we take the Django approach here? What's the, the Django approach to doing something like this? And there's many ways to, to deal with this. We'll just start with an auth backend. So who in the room has actually like, really dealt with auth backends, like, like really dealt with them? And it knows what they are, at least. OK. So Django being its like, flexible, pluggable framework with reusable components that are mostly optional, but we use a lot of them together, um, has a really flexible auth backend uh, framework. Um, and by off back, and we really mean when you have a username and password, it, it sort of does two things. When I have a username and password, how do I authenticate that user? How do I you know, uh, ensure that that username matches the password they entered and, and ultimately allow them in or not to the website? And if I have some kind of user ID, how do I identify that user that's in the database? So it really exposes two methods, get user and authenticate. Uh, and by default, Django has one, uh, you know, activated auth backend called model backend 
That's the one most people are familiar with, where you're literally entering a username and password into Django. Django's got its own uh, off users table where all that information is stored. Uh, well, in our case, I'm going to try and add another, uh, something, in this case, you know, legacy off backend. I'm going to see what happens. Let's just take the actual table I had in my old system, put it into my application, and, and, uh, and authenticate, authenticate against that. So how does that work? Well, I need to create my own custom auth backend. And by the way, you see I have two backends listed here. Um, Django will use them in, in sequence until it finds one that actually matches. So you'll see in this case, the auth backend one only will, will get called if the model backend failed. Okay? If it failed to find a record uh, that matched in the model backend. All right, so first we've got to implement auth, uh, get user. That, well, that's the easy one. Okay? Um, once they're authenticated, well, then I have to identify the user. Now, in this case, I'm going to, uh, when they're authenticated, I'm going to create a record for them in my Django database, only because having it there is so much easier. It saves so much time. You get to use the native built-in user models, and things work great. Um, so in this case, it's just Django now. Nothing's weird, nothing strange here. I'm just returning the user in my database by ID. Simple enough. Um, the more complicated piece is how we authenticate a user. So we're, we're really going to, you know, it, the method expects the username and password, and then we're going to kind of replicate what we saw or would have seen in that Perl application. We're going to take that username and password and like basically use the same algorithm and compare. So we're basically doing a, a query that looks something like this, right? And please note that the, I got a lot of questions about where the salt comes from. Well, it, the salt's actually the same thing that's in the database record, right? It's that second piece of the, uh, of the, of the string. Um, and we just pass that thing in, the same password that's in the database right back into the crypt method, and that, that's what the salt that it uses when it checks and it compares. So we're going to try and get a record back from our legacy database where the username matches and our password matches the, crypt, the crypted uh, hash uh, with the password, with the current password, that's the salt. That makes sense so far? And sort of the Python code for that is here. Um, you know, the first thing we're going to try and do is run that same method and if we get a row back, we're going to create a user in the database. I'm, I'm setting unusable password here, by the way. Uh, I can't actually use model backend to authenticate because I always want, in this case, to delegate off to the old database. Um, and then I save the user and done. So let's actually take a look and see how that works. Let's do a quick demo. Um, so first notice I have you know, a bunch of tables, but there's two tables here that are important, auth user and legacy users. And I'll take a look at the legacy users table when I have my two favorite musicians listed here and their passwords that are hashed with PG Crypto. Next we're going to use that database intact. Um, so Django auth, you know, uh, admin interface, I've only got my admin user listed here. Those two guys are not listed in this interface. We're just going to go log in, right, with uh, King Buzzo and Thor in this case. And once I log in, I can go to that user page and sure enough, I have a record for King Buzzo. He actually exists. He was created in the Django database. I have access to the Django admin for that user. And he's got no password set because password's always being delegated to some other system. Um, there are so many ways we could approach like this off backend thing. It doesn't have to be a database. We could have made an API call. We could have done all sorts of crazy things. Um, I could actually have not only um, just Set it. I could have taken the same password and put and saved it on this user record altogether, and then not, not have to go back to the other database for that next time the person logs in. The reason I didn't do that is because there's a much easier way to do that, um, and that's where Django password hashers come in. Um, so, what's a Django password hasher? Anyone familiar with password hashers? Cool. It's a really, uh, in my opinion, very flexible, cool way that Django handles the way it stores passwords. Okay. So by default, um, Django uses the PBKDF2 algorithm with a sh uh, shock basic hash. That's sort of its number one way it hashes things. Um, and, and it uses password stretching. As, as of Django 1.11, it's 36,000 iterations of that algorithm. Django 1.10 was 30,000. So over time, they increase the security level of their password storage. Um, and there's a random salt in every one of these things. So if just looking at the Django admin screenshot for my user, we see the algorithm listed, the number of iterations that were used, the salt and then the hash. Um, and you'll see in Django's database how it stores that record. Uh, you know, algorithm dollar sign, iterations dollar sign, salt dollar sign, hash. And that's exactly what we see sort of in that string there for my user. 
Um, and if we interrogate what the password hashes are enabled by default out of Django, you see a list of five here, uh, where that first one is the one that you see encrypted up here, PDF, PDKDF2 uh, password hasher. Um, well, if that's how I'm using all, if I'm using that algorithm, why do I need all these other ones here? Um, well, because it, it will accept any one of them. And, and, and the first one on the list is really considered the primary hasher. So that basically means if I had a, uh, you know, if I had some users whose password was encrypted with bcrypt password hasher, which was very popular at one point in time, um, I have a whole re database full of re users that have that password encrypted. And let's just say as time goes on, things get more secure. Um, there's new algorithms that come up. There's maybe I want more iterations to occur, um, you know, just to keep it stronger. Well, if a user uh, has a password with, uh, encrypted with bcrypt and they go log in. So one, just like the off backends, it will go down this list, try all the algorithms until it finds a match, right? Once it finds a match, if it wasn't the primary algorithm that it, it matched on, it will then re-encrypt the password using the primary algorithm and store that back in the database. So that's actually really cool. And, and that's actually, um, you know, it allows you to do things like, you know, I can just simply jack up. You know, I want 100,000 iterations today. Um, and the next time that user logs in, even if it is the primary algorithm, it will then re-encrypt the thing with 100,000 uh, iterations. Um, a nice way to keep the database really secure, uh, you know, so we don't get like these old passwords that are suddenly not secure anymore. Um, so, how do you implement your own password hasher? So in this case, I want to build my own um, that understands the PG Crypto uh, way of, of storing passwords. Well, according to the Django documentation, I need to, I need to implement these four uh, attributes of a custom password hasher. And I'm going to start with a base password hasher, by the way. It does most of the work for me. I just need to now override the algorithm, which is really just a string to give this thing a name, to uh, a verify method. So I'm going to take a, a password, a username and password, and see if I can match a database record with that information. And then I need to encode, so I have a new password. I'm going to encrypt and store that in the database. Safe summary is just like that, um, like a dictionary that stores the, the, the algorithm itself, the iterations, the you know, masked hash and the masked uh, salt, just for display purposes. And there's a few other methods that you can uh, optionally implement. Um, Let's take a quick look at what that looks like. So in our legacy password hasher, which derives from base password hasher, we're going to call it just PG Crypto. It could be anything. That's just the first part of the string that's stored in the database that identifies what algorithm comes next. Uh, so in our case, we're using PG Crypto. We could use anything we want as long as it doesn't already exist and conflict with something. Um, so we need to implement salt. We actually don't need salt in this case. Um, I implemented it for, for completeness. But in, in this case, we're really just using, we're going to create a password hasher that'll be at the bottom of the hasher list. Once we verify somebody, it's going to get re-encrypted with a new algorithm anyway. So we never really have to create new users with this algorithm in the first place. So therefore, we're never creating new salts. We're only using salts that already exist in the database. Um, but for completeness, here's how we would do it. We're going to actually use Postgres uh, gen salt md5 and return that string back, okay? If we want to do that. To do that. Encode is really the important piece here for our purposes. Um, we're just literally calling select, crypt, boom, password, and salt. Now, again, those are both passed into this method here. So given those two parameters, we're going to get a string back and return it. And we're going to prefix what, we're, what we got out of that database with the name of our algorithm, which in this case is PG Crypto. So far, so good, right? Um, then we need to do the verification. Now, verify is going to take a password that the user is attempting to log in with and the encoded version of that password, uh, which, uh, which is what we have in the database. Okay? So we are going to take those two things. And by the way, you saw in the encode is actually coming from in the encode method, right? We're pulling from the database right there. We're going to take those two values, we're going to compare them, right? So we have the encoded password passed into this. We have the password itself. We're going to encode the password, and we're going to use the hash that was passed in, the, the encrypted part, as the salt, because that's actually part of the, part of the actual um, thing that's stored in the database here. And we're going to compare those two and return a true if they match, false if they don't match. And this constant time compare is literally nothing more than a very fancy string comparison operator. Um, 
So that's the most important piece here, verify, along with encode. Safe summary is literally nothing more than just a dictionary. The algorithm, the hash, the, you know, and, and the, um, in this case, we don't have a, a, a salt we're storing separate from the hash because the salt we care about is actually in the hash. Hardened runtime. This is an optional method. We're simply only passing it and not doing anything here because it will suppress the error if you don't. There's a warning that comes up. Um, hard runtime exists, which is actually kind of cool. Um, it allows you to add more, like, to waste more time when encoding stuff, okay? Uh, which is a really good thing when you're trying to be secure. You don't want people to quickly try all the combinations. It'll just put delays in the whole process. So we could, like, throw a wait in here, or we can do, like, 10,000 or 50,000 more iterations of the, of the uh, encryption here. Um, and so lastly here, let's take a look and see a demo. So in this case, I'm going to first have a migration process. Right? We're going to put all of these user records in our off user database. I would not do it with Postgres or database. I would use Python to do this. But being a Postgres conference, I decided to use SQL instead. Um, but basically, we're going to create user records, and we're going to set the password equal to our algorithm, PG crypto dollar sign, and then the hash that was in the other database, which starts with the dollar sign, and then you see the one and everything else beyond that, where my username is King Diamond. Um, and you can see once I do that, my user record exists with the username and my uh, safe summary showing me that the algorithm is PG crypto and the hash is listed right there. So far, so good. So that user um, does not have a really usable password as far as Django is concerned until uh, our, our hasher exists and works. So let's try it out. Let's log in as King Diamond. Thor is the password. And boom, suddenly that same user where previously it showed a PG crypto as the algorithm now actually has the primary algorithm, PBK DF2 SHA-236. Uh, 36,000 iterations, that's safe again, and there's salt and hash. So now we've basically upgraded this user um, into the primary hash algorithm. Um, and we're good to go. That user will never have to look back at the legacy database anymore. That old password is gone. I mean, the password exists, but the algorithm is gone. Um, and every time a user logs in, uh, it'll, it'll happen here. Now, one thing to note, um, we don't actually want, I, I said I did a migration process here where I put these seemingly insecure hashes into our database, right? And I can log in with that. That's, that's, that's you know, that is really not what I want to do. Because, you know, I, I, we have a situation here where we have a primary, alg primary algorithm, which is really our preferred algorithm. And then I have something that's not preferred. Um, and it's not preferred for a few reasons. One, it's probably not as secure as the primary. So if I pump in 300,000, 50,000 re records of, you know, less than ideal records, uh, you know, encryption, I have a potential uh, vulnerability, right? So rather than just leave it the way it is, we actually have another hasher that does the combination of two things. One, it will, it will do exactly what this one did, where it just uses the same exact BG crypto crypt method, and then it will also encrypt it with the primary algorithm on top of that. So we get this, like, this combination quasi um, sort of two-step encryption uh, that gives us the, primary, the, the security of the primary encryption with the ability to undo it twice to get to the PG crypto uh, lesser secure um, legacy encryption method. Um, so that's that. So basically, um, I have uploaded a bunch of examples to uh, that GitHub repository. And these slides will end up being on my, my website. Um, any questions? All right, well, thank you all very much. Thanks for coming and staying.